Hey, welcome to our channel. Today I'm doing a video on misrepresentation. This is a topic that's very complicated uh, and it's very sad too because if there is misrepresentation in a file, this can sometimes mean that the person is excluded from sponsoring a child or a spouse to Canada. Um, there are different types of misrepresentation, um, which can also lead, for example, if you misrepresented, which means that you lied in a visitor visa application, you can be um, refused from entering Canada, uh, you can have a bar to Canada for multiple years, um, or it can be very difficult for you to, to be able to get approvals in the future. I'm not going to talk about that type of misrepresentation. The type of misrepresentation uh, that we're going to focus on this video is about exclusion. So this happens when, uh, for example, um, someone immigrates to Canada um, under the express entry category, for example, and um, fails to disclose that he has two dependent children um, in in um, in the application. So this means that in the forms he does not indicate where it says do you have any children. He um, he doesn't indicate that he has children. There's no documentation <clears throat> about the the children birth certificates or anything like that. And there's no mention as to why he's not mentioning them. So what happens in the future if is once he's a permanent resident, couple of, couple of years later, his children are still under um, have the age requirement to be uh, sponsored to Canada under a child sponsorship application. Uh, this person decides to now sponsor his children to Canada, um, but immigration um, finds out through the history of the file that in this person's permanent resident application, uh, he had not disclosed his children. This means that his children um, are not a uh, member of the family class because they were not um, disclosed in the initial application. Another example, which is very common, is a woman immigrates to Canada <clears throat> Um, um, in a skilled worker or applies for Canadian Express entry, um, various ap application, becomes a permanent resident and fails to indicate that she has a husband. Um, she's been married to a husband uh, for many years or it could also be a common law partner, uh, fails to disclose. It could be for different reasons. It could be um, that it's a mistake. She, she incorrectly filled out the forms. It could be that um, some people think that because you are in a common law relationship, which, which means that you have been living continuously with your partner for at least 12 months in Canada or outside Canada, uh, this is not a spouse. So in the forms, but for example, in this case, she doesn't indicate that. Or it could be that some, I get a lot of uh, consultations where people say, well, I thought that if I included my, <clears throat> my, uh, my, uh, my husband, it would take much longer for my application, so I didn't think it was a big deal. Uh, I didn't I didn't put him and I just thought I would sponsor him later. Or we see this a lot is someone applies to become a permanent resident. Their file is in process for a year. They get a letter saying that their application is approved and they're soon going to get a confirmation of permanent resident. In that one or two month period, um, they decide, well, they do get married and they fail to update immigration with their marital status. Or when they come to get landed at the border in Canada or within Canada, they, on the confirmation of permanent residence and in discussion with the officer, um, there's always information about how you need to update any, any information about your marital status. They fail to disclose that they've been married. And now a couple of months later, they're like, oh, I'm a permanent resident. Now I'm going to sponsor my, my wife, my husband. And um, the wife or the husband is excluded because you failed to disclose this before you became a permanent resident. So unfortunately, what we see is a lot of, um, sometimes people fail to disclose for deliberate reasons. Uh, sometimes they want to hide certain things. For example, they have a dependent child that's, that has a disability. Um, they have a, 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 sponsor, um, a husband or a common law partner that has a, med um, a criminal history, which, which might make the, uh, the sponsor or the applicant uh, for their permanent resident application inadmissible. Um, and these cases are very kind of black and white in the sense that obviously you did this because you wanted to gain a benefit under the act um, and you did this intentionally so you, you cannot you know, sponsor uh, anymore. But the, the cases that I, I see very often are cases where people just made an honest mistake for different 
different, very complicated, very personalized reasons. Uh, for example, we see a lot of cases where um, uh, same-sex couples in certain countries where it's forbidden to be in that relationship, one of them immigrates to Canada. Um, but because of fear of, of discovery of the relationship um, and other reasons, um, they do not disclose the, the, the partner. Uh, and this is done out of fear and it's also done out of, well, I don't, you know, I don't really understand that in Canada this is allowed and here it, I'm not supposed to, you know, disclose it. I can't um, be public with this information, so I'm not going to disclose this. But then when they come to Canada and they understand the rules and they see that in Canada this is something that's allowed, they decide, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sponsor my partner now of, of 15 years. And then they get this refusal letter that says, well, you misrepresented, you didn't disclose that you were in this relationship for so many years. So these are these those types of cases are very, very difficult. And I get very um, heartbroken a lot of times when I when I hear them, because <clears throat> it's sometimes it's really honest mistakes where people that didn't know, didn't get legal advice, didn't understand um, or they got legal advice from certain people in their community or certain agencies or certain representative that told them, you know what, don't disclose, you do, you do this and then you'll figure it out. It's, it's unfortunate because it literally ruins lives and it could separate uh, family members, loved ones from each other for a very long time, if not forever. Um, it's a little bit cruel as a law, I find, um, because there are some people that are not doing it intentionally. They're just very confused and they don't know when there's circumstances in their life that made it that they, they made this, this unfortunate mistake. Um, now, what to do when this happens? There are solutions. It's not always possible. So it's important, I would say, for this type of case to really consult with a lawyer. Not every immigration application needs to be, you, you don't need to always have a lawyer. But for this type of complicated case, I think it's necessary to consult with a lawyer who's going to be able to look at all the details of the file and your case and look at the case law and look at the history and tell you, you know what, let's try this humanitarian approach. Let's try this temporary resident permit at TRP or let's contest this um, in the federal court at a judicial review. Um, but it depends. Uh, not every, even though sometimes it's very, very difficult, even if we do the agency, even if we do the TRP or the federal court, it might not work. But in some very specific cases, if you get proper legal advice and your representative, your lawyer is able to properly prepare the application, there are some chances that um, it could be approved. There is the exception in the act with respect to humanitarian and compassionate factors where an officer, um, when reviewing all of the details of the case, has discretion to determine, okay, you are excluded, but there are enough factors to let you in. We've done many of those cases, um, and we've been not always successful, but in, in the cases that we usually take on, most of the time we are successful because we carefully select those cases, and we make sure we explain to the clients um, that this is going to be a difficult case. It might not work, uh, but if you want to try everything and you want to make sure you at least try to get your partner or your child here, we can do this this way. We can work together as a team um, to provide very, very strong documentation. So um, if we do prepare those types of applications, we give you a very detailed list of documents um, to support your application. So we want to write strong submission letters. We want to explain every detail that led to the exclusion. We want, we want to ask you to give a lot of reference letters from friends and family, people in your community that know the history and, and can attest to the fact as to why you decided to, to not mention your, your partner or your child. Um, so we can file an application under humanitarian grounds. Um, we can always request a, try to request a temporary resident permit to allow uh, the person to come in temporarily until all of this is sorted. And if th that application is refused, if it's a strong, good application, sometimes what we do is we file, a if it's refused, we file a judicial review at the federal court. Uh, because sometimes that, that's the only way for us to win an approval is if we go to a federal court. And if it, if we build a strong file for the federal court, sometimes we even get a consent before going in front of a judge. So that could be quite um, fast. And if we do get a consent or if we do get the judicial review al allowed, what happens is that the file that we initially submitted under humanitarian grounds goes back to the embassy or the high consulate for a redetermination by a different officer. So a different officer will now look at the file 
and make a decision based on the federal court decision. Decision. This does not mean that the um, decision will be positive 100%. I would say most of the time it's approved. I would say a good 95, 98% of the time. All the cases I've done for a redetermination have always been approved when we're at that stage. But an officer can find other reasons or same reasons but worded differently to refuse again. Hopefully not, but that is a possibility. Um, so we would then go for redetermination. The officer would ask for updated documentation. And usually we're able to get the process moving um, kind of fast in order to, to have the application approved so that your, your family member uh, can become a, a permanent resident of Canada. Um, if you have any questions uh, about this, if you feel you're in a situation, a similar situation where uh, you feel there, somebody told you that this is not possible, but you feel that your mistake was an honest mistake and, and, and you feel you might have some humanitarian compassionate grounds, do send us an email at uh, info at keyorkimmigrationlaw.com and we'll set up a time to speak with you um, to see if we can help you out. Thank you.